caffeine versus a nootropic and where they possibly intersect. By the end of this video, you will know exactly what makes a nootropic versus a stimulant. They are two very different things, but they can also work synergistically. And if you understand what a nootropic truly is by the seven pillars that I'm going to kind of categorize, I think you'll be able to choose a good nootropic for you, but you'll also, I don't know, get rid of some of that potential negative connotation that comes along with nootropics. I do want to make sure you hit the red subscribe button and then hit that bell icon. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. Let's first break down a little bit of caffeine. Now, caffeine's just talked about way too much, so I'm going to keep it short. Okay, caffeine, yes, it's a stimulant because it provides, in essence, almost its own fuel. It does increase the use of existing fuel substrates, potentially a little bit more glucose, definitely a little bit more fatty acid utilization, but caffeine operates sort of on its own. It's a nervous system stimulant. And how it does that is it binds to an adenosine receptor, which hear me out on how this works. When you get tired at the end of the day, you have a buildup of adenosine. Think of it as this. Think of it as sleep pressure. Okay, see, I, I have little teeny kids. I've got an eight-month-old and I've got a three-year-old. And when you look at all the parenting journals and all the things like that, they talk about you want them to build, quote, sleep pressure so that they can fall asleep. Got to get them tired enough to fall asleep, right? You see, caffeine basically stops the sleep monster from binding to its receptor. So normally you have adenosine and it piles up at the end of the day and the adenosine makes you finally feel tired. Well, caffeine looks just like adenosine. So caffeine occupies the adenosine receptor and that makes it so that we artificially don't feel tired because the adenosine is not binding to that receptor. Well, as a result, it stimulates our nervous system and our nervous system is ultimately creating the energy. I shouldn't say creating the energy. We're still creating the energy from our, our own substrates and stuff, but the actual stimulation is on the nervous system because we're blocking the governor. We're blocking what would normally govern how much energy we have at a certain point in time to a degree. Okay, now then there's all these secondary effects with caffeine, right? Then there's things like phosphodiesterase inhibition, which sounds complicated, but basically it's something that ultimately makes it so that you're releasing more noradrenaline, more norepinephrine, and making it so that you can uh, mobilize free fatty acids. There's all, it's beneficial, right? And the long and the short of it is, we have two different ways that we can metabolize caffeine and metabolize stimulants. Okay, and a lot of times it has to do with our genome, like who we are as a person. And there's specific genes that people have. There's people that have what's uh, called the CYP1A2 gene that have a lot of it, and there's people that don't have a lot of it. And those are gonna be fast metabolizers versus slow metabolizers. I'll cut straight to the chase here. Point is, is there's some people that get a heavy, heavy, heavy neurological response from caffeine, and it sticks with them. Maybe you're one of those people where you have some caffeine and then you don't sleep that night, even if you had it six hours before. And then there's people that can have that cup of coffee after dinner right before bed and it has no effect on them. Okay, it all depends on how you metabolize it and how it affects your nervous system. So this is kind of the big overarching negative attribute of stimulants, right? Is there's a lot of variance between how you can achieve a benefit from it and it can be hard to determine how you're gonna to react to it because it all depends on a lot of external factors. Now I wanna compare that with a nootropic. And this again, I promise you, is not to say that one is better than the other because they work synergistically. I just wanna be able to paint a picture. A nootropic is all about supporting and sort of stacking various avenues to get more out of your existing brain and your existing energy. So a nootropic is more about making sure you're not borrowing from tomorrow to use today. It's about making sure you have the clear pathway. So I've divided it into what I call seven pillars. There's seven fundamental things that we kind of angle a nootropic after. And the first one is inhibition. Okay, if you inhibit certain things from happening, then it allows other things to happen. And a perfect example of that with inhibition is the use of theanine as a common nootropic. You see, theanine makes you feel calm, which would imply that it's really not a nootropic. Why would you want to feel calm? Well, the evidence demonstrates that a calm brain is a happy, well-functioning brain. You see, when our brain has a lot of what is called glutamate, a lot of glutamate activity, glutamate binding, it ends up being kind of neurotic and, and just kind of cray cray. And that makes it so you're not getting what you really want out of it. You ever had too much caffeine? But it's not like you feel energized. It's not like you're getting anything done. You're maybe cleaning something on the floor like aggressively, but you're not actually being productive with your life. Okay, so theanine is just a perfect example because what it does is it inhibits glutamate from binding to its receptor. So 
by consequence, you end up feeling more calm and clear. Okay, so inhibition, that's one pillar. Okay, then another pillar is going to be delivery. The delivery of fuel, the delivery and proper allocation of nutrients and fuel to make us feel better. Again, a good example is going to be nitric oxide, or in this case, like beets, right? Okay, beets or beet powder or something like that, something that's gonna stimulate nitric oxide. It ends up taking what is called dietary nitrate and converting it to active nitrite. Now, that expands the blood vessels a little bit, okay, it relaxes the blood vessels so you get more blood flow more potential blood flow to the brain. If you were to look at an fMRI scan and look at the brain, the brain would be more lit up in someone that has a little bit more blood flow. So then we have that whole concept, delivery. How do you get more of the nutrients to something? How do you actually deliver what is important? See, nothing has changed from a stimulant perspective. You're just taking what is there and reallocating it or making it more available. This is where a lot of energy drinks and things like that fall short because they'll load you up with a lot of stimulants and they'll load you up with a lot of protective mechanisms to protect the stimulant and allow the stimulant to be more effective but not truly looking at like sustainable fuel. If you want my recommendation on an energy drink, by the way, I highly recommend you check out Brain Fuel down below in the description. Just like the name implies, Brain Fuel is designed to be more of what they call a cerebral beverage versus an energy drink. It's not there to give you energy, it's there to potentially help you utilize what is in your body a little bit better. So I'm a big fan of these guys. The founder is a doctor and he knows what he's talking about. He's got a proven track record in this industry and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. So when you look at kind of the balance of nootropic and the balance of proper stimulant, I think they've done a really good job with it and they've quickly become my go-to when it comes down to an energy drink because I'm not a big energy drink guy. I'm more about harnessing what your body can usually do with its own fuel. That's why I'm such a big fan of kind of stressing the body at the right point and everything to try to elicit a better response internally. So definitely check them out. There's a link down below in the description. Okay, and moving on, we talk about uh, the next pillar. Okay, so we've talked about inhibition. We've talked about delivery. Now I want to talk about actual energy stores. Okay, energy stores in the way of phosphate. So creatine is a perfect example of a nootropic from that perspective. You see, creatine provides us with additional phosphate for fuel. Now, let me just briefly explain what that means. If you take a creatine supplement for muscle building, it's a perfect analogy and kind of breakdown to show you what happens. Okay, you are providing yourself with a phosphate molecule so that when your body creates energy, it cleaves off a phosphate molecule and has to reattach another one. Well, normally, you don't have enough phosphate molecules to continue to reattach forever, right? Eventually, you run out of energy, and that's exactly what you feel when you run out of gas when you're working out, okay? Well, what creatine does is it provides you with additional phosphate, but it's sort of at a chemical level, right? So you have more phosphate so you can create more energy faster. You're not literally giving yourself energy. You're giving yourself more energy stores that your body could pull from. And it doesn't just happen at a muscle level. It happens at the brain level, too. Okay, so you actually have energy in its molecular form. So now we have inhibition, we have delivery, and we have energy stores. Then we have respiration at the cellular level. Another way that we get an effect, like a, an actual energy-like effect, okay? And that is supporting our nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide and nicotinamide mononucleotide, nicotine riboside, all that whole different pathway. And that sounds like crazy Greek because it is, and you don't really need to know the names. All it's important to know is that when we eat food, we break food down into electrons. And those electrons have to get to where they are going to ultimately create an explosion that is energy. It's, I sound like a crazy person when I say explosion, but if you were to magnify what happens in a little microscopic cell, it would be an explosion. It's just happening at such a small level, we don't think of it as such. Every little movement, me moving my hands right now, multiple explosions, right? So how do we actually deliver the energy for that explosion at a cellular level? It's called cellular respiration. And that's another avenue that we look at. So supplementing with things like, again, if you're looking at kind of hardcore nootropic supplements, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, nicotinamide riboside. If you know what those are, you know what those are. If not, look them up. Okay, now the pillars we have covered, we have inhibition, we have delivery, we have energy stores, we have respiration for the explosion, but what about fuel? Fuel itself, okay, 
that's where specific kinds of fuels that work well for energy production come in. Fuels like ketones, okay, exogenous ketone supplements or ketones from the kinds of food you eat. Uh, MCT oil, which gets converted into ketones easier and can provide a fuel that is more substantial for the brain. That's another nootropic avenue that we typically see, right? Okay, let's give our body the right fuel that our brain can actually use. Not just the energy, but the fuel that the body can convert and utilize properly. Okay, so we have inhibition, we have delivery, we have energy stores, we have respiration, and now we have fuel. And we have two more remaining, and that's kind of what makes a nootropic. The next one is new growth and adaptogenic compounds. There are compounds out there like lion's mane and like chaga and some of these adaptogens that have been demonstrated to grow new nerve cells and grow new neurons, right? It's called nerve growth factor. It's also called brain-derived neurotropic factor. So you can actually help grow the neurons. And that all comes as a response from different kind of feedback mechanisms within the body. So there's all kinds of adaptogens that work in that category and that new growth category. And then last but not least is electricity as far as minerals go. Whenever our nerves send a signal and there's an action potential and a neuron firing and the nervous system has to work, it needs certain sodium potassium pumps. And without having the balance of those different minerals, then you're not sending the right nerve signal. Thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, every millisecond, right, going on in our brain, it's a lightning storm. And it's all using electricity, it's all using sodium, potassium, magnesium, all these different minerals. And if you've ever been electrolyte depleted after a workout, not only are your muscles cramping, but your brain goes into a serious fog. So electrolytes play a big role. So to sum it up, again, the seven pillars of the nootropics, we end up having inhibition, we have delivery, we have energy stores, we have respiration, we have fuel, we have adaptogenic compounds and growth, and finally we have electricity. You see how those are entirely different from a stimulant, where we just activated the central nervous system. Now imagine them working in tandem. See what I mean? That's how you start building the ultimate stack. I'll see you tomorrow.